Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Admiral Kurt Tidd, the commander of U.S. Southern Command. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much, uh, Rod Mulhardley. Thank you for the uh, for that introduction. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> Short and sweet. What I really appreciate, though, is the, the invitation to come and spend a little bit of time speaking with you all today, and and to this uh, this group. And I know we've got uh, we got a fair number of folks, not only from from the War College, but uh, but from across the community. Um, this is the intellectual heart and soul of the maritime side of our military forces, but what makes it truly an intellectual powerhouse is the, the representation of all of the members of the armed forces, the members of the interagency, our partner nations that are represented here in the class. So you are what makes this place uh, what it is today. Now, I was, I was delighted. I looked at my, my calendar and I saw March, late March, springtime, springtime in Newport. Now, as a surface warfare officer, I know that typically what that means is most of the snow is off the ground, and part of the time you don't get the 30-knot fog blowing sideways. Uh, as we were driving in today, I realized clear blue sky, so this is pretty darn good for springtime in Newport, so it's, it's a delight to be here. You probably don't want to know that as we were taken off from Miami, the temperature was 70 degrees. <laughs> Miami is not such a bad place to be stationed. <laughs> well, we've got War College students, we've got the terrific faculty of the War College here, and I understand uh, having, uh, having spent a little bit of time on a bridge of a ship, particularly on the mid-watches, we got a few students from the SWAS class, is that right? One or two, no? I don't see anybody in here, okay. Then uh, it's, it, it, we've got, uh, as I said, the partners uh, from all of our partner nations that are represented here and particularly some from Latin America and the Caribbean. Raise your hand so I can, there you are, okay. Perfect. Buenos dias, bon dia, bonjour. And it's good to have you all here with us today. So I'm told we've got about an hour set aside, and what I want to do is spend a little bit of my time making some remarks, but what I really want to do is spend some time talking with you. So I'll give about 15 minutes of, uh, of framing thoughts, and then I'll, what I want to do is open the floor to discussion. We can talk about uh, pretty much anything that's on your mind, uh, either Southcom, my, my current position, or anything else that, uh, that you might be interested in asking questions about. Now what I'll do is spend most of my time talking about how we see the strategic environment in Southern Command. But when we do start with the Q&A session, as I said, floor's open, fight's on, feel free to ask any questions that you've got. Now I'm gonna do a little bit, uh, something a little different with my comments today. Rather than giving you a Southcom 101 overview, I'm gonna offer our perspective on how the complexities of the changing security environment are playing out in the Americas. Latin America's connections to the broader global landscape may seem obvious to many of you, especially those who are studying the region or who are from this region. But you'd be surprised how many people don't fully appreciate what's going on in this part of the world or see how deeply it's related to the broader global security challenges. Now, I don't mean that as a criticism. We've got a very crowded national security agenda. We've got a competitive China, a resurgent Russia, a dangerous North Korea, and a destabilizing Iran. Comparatively speaking, Latin America and the Caribbean is a good news story. No interstate conflict, no WMD proliferation, no rogue regimes exporting terrorism, no existential threat posed by violent extremists. Much of the news coming out of this region is good, great even. Colombia has signed a peace accord. Nations like Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Colombia are providing significant contributions to international security and expanding cooperation with one another on a range of issues. But these positive developments belie some very complex challenges. 
These challenges aren't the type that dominate the headlines or policymaking, at least not yet. They defy conventional wisdom, and they don't fit neatly into our strategic frameworks. They've been evolving, and in some cases, accelerating in recent years, but on a trajectory that's far more subtle than in other theaters. They're the type of challenges that blur the line between crime and war, competition and conflict, and simmering problems and crises. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Latin America and the Caribbean is the next frontier of some of the toughest, most complex, and most dynamic security challenges that exist today. These challenges aren't military threats, but neither are they solely developmental or diplomatic issues. There's something else, something that falls into a gray area that's not very well defined and with rules that, frankly, we're still trying to figure out. But what's happening in this gray zone has significant implications for regional and international stability, democratic governance, and what's going to, to be demanded of all of us as leaders if we're going to effectively address them. So let's start with the most significant of those security challenges, threat networks. We started using this term to encompass a whole range of bad actors, terrorist supporters, sympathizers, drug traffickers, arms dealers, human smugglers, money launderers, and the like, from criminal organizations to extremist groups. In whatever form they take, the real profound security threat they pose lies not in the products that they are moving or the people that they are recruiting, but instead in the interrelated effects that they are having on the broader security environment. This is a major shift in how we used to think about this challenge. We used to focus only on the activities of these groups, the drugs they were smuggling, the coca they were growing, money they were laundering, or the radicalization that they were fostering. But here's the problem with looking at it that way. You can't defeat a commodity or a tactic, especially when you're facing a thinking challenge that is constantly evolving and adapting. 30 years ago, we focused on large cartels with designated leaders and relatively straightforward operations. Today, those cartels have diversified, they've decentralized, and they've franchised their operations. They are borderless, operating with fluidity and, and impunity. Their operations span Latin America, and they reach deep into the United States and stretch across the Atlantic and the Pacific. They work in the margins, intimidating or buying off the support of civilian populations, controlling po politicians, making alliances with security forces, or using institutions to camouflage their objectives. To quote a great line from the book, Gangster warlords, these groups are a dark force with shady interests that we struggle to even see, much less understand. Every time we think we have them figured out or think we've had an impact because we've made a successful drug bust or arrested one of their leaders, they change and they morph. Enormous profit margins help enable this rapid pace of change. Threat networks now control an illicit revenue stream that's worth an estimated $2 trillion. That money allows the purchase of capabilities that far outmatch local law enforcement. Military-grade military weapons, rocket-propelled grenades, armored vehicles, the latest in GPS technology to track their illegal shipments, sophisticated smuggling tunnels, semi-submersible submarines, you name it, and these guys likely have it. And they use it, not just to move illicit products, but to attack, to intimidate, and to kill. And as they pursue those illicit profits, what these groups are really engaged in is an assault on the rule of law and everything that it stands for. By, undermi by undermining rule of law and corrupting institutions, Threat networks gain and wield power. Unconventional power, but power all the same. 
And it's a power that directly threatens democratic governance and democratic progress. Now take a look at some of the images behind me. These are a couple of recent examples of what partners like Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, and Jamaica are up against. Retaliatory car bombs detonating outside police headquarters, wounding over 40 and killing five officers. Turf battles that turn into citywide shootouts between criminal groups vying for control of the cocaine trade. Murder rates and criminality so high that the military has to be brought in to try and regain control. And let me be clear about one thing. This is not a Latin American problem. I'm not singling out any one of our partners. I could just as easily put up a picture of Chicago or Los Angeles. We're dealing with this challenge, too, on a different scale, but in some of our largest cities. MS-13 and M-18 were born in Los Angeles, after all. Affiliates of Mexican cartels run distribution hubs from Chicago, Miami, and Baltimore. And criminal networks fight fierce battles here at home, too. Ultimately, it doesn't matter which country this is taking place in, because the truth is, in some form or another, it's taking place in every single one of our countries. All over the world, we're seeing elements of a broader system of violence, alternative order, and criminality. This system exists in parallel with, and occasionally overlaps, the legitimate Westphalian-based governments. Its purpose typically isn't to overturn or replace legitimate governments. Instead, it corrodes governments from within, weakening them just enough to make it easy to do business. The cumulative effects eat away at core democratic values like the rule of law. These groups play a major role in fostering the corruption and insecurity that erodes citizens' faith in democracy, especially in countries with the highest levels of criminal violence. And that corruption and insecurity, in turn, drain precious financial resources away from the state, making it harder to address more entrenched development challenges and to achieve lasting economic prosperity, which, of course, provides fertile ground for threat networks to operate. Now, this is a vicious cycle, and it, as much, and it is as much a threat to democratic progress as revisionist powers or rogue regimes. And this is precisely what makes the global security environment so complex. We also have to deal with those revisionist powers and those rogue regimes. The global challenges of Russia and China, and to a lesser extent Iran and North Korea, are all active in Latin America and the Caribbean. While their motivations for engaging in the region vary, they're all engaged in certain activities that run counter to established inter-American norms and values. For now, I'll focus on the first two countries. Russia's increased role in the Western Hemisphere, or anywhere for that matter, is alarming, given its intelligence and cyber capabilities, proven interference in multiple elections, and global intent to upend the international order, disrupt regional politics, and discredit democratic institutions. Russia also continues to sell arms and military equipment to unfriendly regimes who do not share or respect democratic values. As for China, former Secretary of State Tillerson said it best, China's economic engagement offers the appearance of an attractive path to development. But this engagement comes at a price. The Chinese model extracts natural resources to feed its own economy, often with little regard for environmental laws, fair trade practices, or human rights. China is using economic statecraft to pull Latin America into its orbit as part of their intent to reshape the international system in its favor. Now that has significant strategic implications because that, that international system is founded on principles like rule of law, the protection of human rights, and the right to free and fair elections. It's comprised of nations who value equal partnerships and who cooperate freely with one another without coercion. 
Russia and China in particular have a decidedly mixed track record when it comes to respecting those principles in the Western Hemisphere and elsewhere. Now, neither of them are directly, overtly threatening democratic values. Instead, they're engaged in something more complicated, more opaque, something in that gray zone that I talked about earlier that's hard to see and even harder to define. Looking beyond regional dynamics and strategic competition, even in major conflict, we have to contend with a global gray zone struggle. Future wars won't necessarily be determined by militaries slugging it out in set piece battles. The truth is, it's probably never been that way. But today more than ever, future conflicts will be a complex struggle in that gray zone. And that struggle may not even come to war or may not resemble it in the way that we expect based on our careful study of history and military theory. For non-state and state adversaries alike, disrupting the current order and changing international norms is merely one front in a multifaceted battle. And whether they're operating in the violent slums of urban cities, in the voting chambers of international bodies, make no mistake, this is a struggle for the future of the world as we know it, the system that sustains it and the principles that uphold it. So what does this mean for all of us? And especially in the position where you are today, what does it mean for all of you? Well, for one thing, it means we have to get a lot more knowledgeable about these complexities. And we have to get far more comfortable with an environment replete with uncertainty and ambiguity. And with understanding how all of this fits together. How the rule of law, for example, is fundamental to understanding the security environment and to recognizing how both non-state and state actors might seek to subvert it. How issues like unmet development goals and entrenched socioeconomic challenges could become breeding ground for other, much larger transnational threats. How threats to our shared security, shared stability, and shared prosperity may disguise themselves in forms that we don't expect, or may manifest themselves, often deliberately, in ways that don't seem malign, at least on the surface. Now that's quite a list, but here's the good news. As the regional security environment continues to change, another change has also been underway. And that's a growing recognition that we need to move beyond bilateral cooperation between individual nations or between individual services. And we need to build something that better reflects the interconnected world in which we live and the interconnected challenges that we face. What we really need to create is a system that brings this all together, a network of our own, a network that spans the full spectrum of all of the friendly actors, like-minded nations, a diverse range of government agencies, multilateral organizations, stakeholders in the private sector, civil society, and non-governmental organizations, all working together, all doing their part, integrating and aligning their efforts to promote security and to protect our values. One network, united in purpose, unified in action. Sounds easy, right? Well. That's the charge that's facing each of you today against these types of challenges, but also against myriad others. And what really faces us is a choice. Now that's my message to all of you. That's what the 21st century demands of all of us. As future leaders, it demands it of all of you. It's a choice between the past and the future between approaches that were built for fundamentally different problem sets or for embracing something new to protect something enduring. We can stay in the past or we can change. We can adapt, we can build connections across services, between agencies and surpassing borders. So take a good look around you today. These aren't just your fellow students. 
This is the start of your own network. Choose your network well. Thank you very much, and I welcome your questions.